In the news tonight, Barbados will soon have its first ever biogas service station. A suggestion Barbados needs to become a knowledge-based economy and focus on exporting ideas. An aquaponics project launched with educators and agricultural officials saying it will benefit the students and the country as a whole. And in sports, All Saints, St. George and Charles F. Broom take honours at today's BSAC Zonal Meets. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Broom. Thank you so much for tuning in. In our top story tonight, Barbadians may soon have access to a more cost-effective and environmentally friendly fuel. This will be possible once a pilot project by a local biofuel company is successful. On the 15th of June, Rum and Sargassum Inc. will open the country's first ever biogas service station. The company produces fossil fuel-free, renewable compressed natural gas using rum industry wastewater, sargassum seaweed, and Barbados black belly sheep manure. CEO and founder Dr. Logina Henry says the experimental pilot gas station will be set up at the Barbados National Oil Company, the BNOC. Rum and sargassum is a spin-off based on results we got in the lab at UE Cave Hill. And so we've been building the company. Um, we've been in collaboration with BNOC, so we're here at BNOC, um, where we have access to a natural gas car, a gas compressor, and have been working and collaborating with BNOC to make this a reality. Um, I think the, one of the beautiful things about biogas in the renewable energy transition is the existing energy companies, the existing government um, gas company can benefit from a new fuel and all the technology they've already gotten used to using, the pipelines, the pumps, the, the, um, there's a gas grid in Barbados. So we don't want to say in a renewable energy era you're going to abandon all these physical assets which have been built up and invested in over many decades. According to the company, the aim is to provide an expensive transportation fuel for 60% of the country's road traffic and at the same time address the problem of high prices for imported fossil fuels. Dr. Henry, a lecturer in renewable energy at UEKFL, is optimistic Barbados can reap significant benefits from the project. We are um, starting to engage the public and so we have a growing waiting list of potential customers and so anybody who is interested to be in part of this um, movement and this fuel cost reduction can get to our webpage www.rumandsargassum.com and they could enter their information and get in line and we'll be happy to engage potential customers. Our hope for first sales at the pump is April 2026. Dr. Henry says the project will last for a period of six months. This is a six-month pilot, basically a demo. Um, we, we know that we, we, within the conversations we've had with funders um, for, towards scaling up of this solution, a working model is important. And so we want to, we believe in it, but we want everybody else to believe in it. So we're demonstrating that with this pilot. Um, we've gathered support from various grants. Raman Sargassum has raised just over 600,000 U.S. In, term, in terms of searching out the question and understanding how it works and we're at the point now where we are 82 days away from test drive zero um, where we'll, we'll demonstrate a car driving on sargassum fuel. Rum and Sargassum Inc. will be holding talks to obtain funding to make biogas available for drivers on a commercial level. Sean Farrell, CBC News. Well, turning to news from the Upper House now, a government senator is advocating for Barbados to become a knowledge-based economy. Minister of Economic Affairs and Investment Chad Blackman believes the island can look at exporting ideas to help other countries solve their issues. He made the comments during the debate on the Appropriation Bill 2024 in the Upper Chamber. In order for Barbados to continue to be the world leader, it is in its weight class an intellectual thought leader, we have to transform our educational base. Because why those skills don't just pop out of the sky? And I understand the natural inclination for those who have benefited from a system that is based on colonial frame and elitism. But the truth is that I can tell you, and I, I Mr. Speaker, I say so humbly, if 
room where I sat as the senior advisor to the Director General of the ILO, International Labour Organization. I can tell you that the skills required for our people, we have to transform our education system. Have to. If not, we're going to be left with an empty bag in our hand. But now is the time to do so. And in his contribution, Independent Senator Andrew Malalu has asked government to openly support employers who followed the COVID-19 directives. He says if something is not done, it leaves employers vulnerable to lawsuits by employees. It is my belief that government should come out and openly support the employers who implemented these policies and confirm that such policies were necessary, were reasonable, and are not discriminatory. Referring to a recent case where judgment was passed in favor of the employee, Senator Malalu says government should consider legislation to this effect. A new aquaponics and farming initiative described as a milestone for education and agriculture has been set up in Barbados. It's a joint project of the Legacy Foundation and the Ellerton Primary School. Trevor Thorpe reports. Before a joint unveiling of the project, the school's principal, Andrew Haynes, said the new growth aquaponics and farming project was a reflection of skill, hard work and dedication of the team working over and beyond the call of duty. Our vision for this project is centered around our students. Through this initiative, they will gain invaluable educational opportunities, delving into hands-on experiences in animal husbandry, sustainable agriculture and the principles of aquaponics. This practical approach extends their learning beyond textbooks, allowing them to apply classroom knowledge to real-world scenarios and setting them up for success in the real world. Agricultural science teacher and project lead Lisa Greenwich said they have developed a holistic outdoor environment at the school and gave some insight into the initiative. We are particularly happy with the results of our climate smart irrigation system, Beehive. This system has fully automated our irrigation, but also works with monitoring predicted and current weather conditions to modify watering where and when needed in the established zone. The relationship between the school and the Legacy Foundation goes back to 2014. Vice Chairman Iodell Burroughs said the project comes at a cost of $40,000 and has lived up to expectations. Legacy's theme, supporting learning, wellness and empowerment, was very much borne out in the vision of the school's projects. From today, Ellerton Primary becomes one of only a few public schools in Barbados equipped with an aquaponic strategy and perhaps the first of our primary schools. Housing Minister Dwight Sutherland said government cannot do it all and such an initiative is an achievement for the school. And for us to truly achieve a Barbados punching above its weight, projects such as these, where Legacy Foundation and the other private sector entities, joining education, joining renewable energy, joining housing, to allow Barbados to truly flourish and to allow Barbados to become the best place to live, work, do business, raise children and educate them. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Security in Darwin gave the thumbs up for the project. He said aquaponics is part of the mandate of his ministry and has far-reaching implications. My ministry is a ministry of food security, plain and simple. And in order for us to achieve this objective, we have to look not just at commercial farming, but we have to look at community projects and projects within the schools as well, so that when we ramp up, we can build out the food security that we are supposed to have. I'm indeed also very happy that they have already sourced the market for the produce. The students engaged with the project are between 3 and 11 years old. Trevor Thorpe, CBC News. Coming up on Newsnight, the UN asked to support reparatory justice as a development paradigm. 
As Barbados and CARICOM continue on their quest for reparations, a leading Caribbean academic has called on the United Nations to support reparatory justice as a development paradigm. The call by Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, came as he addressed the UN General Assembly in New York to commemorate the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. He says Caribbean countries know all too well the narrative and the tools of terror as they trade dehumanized Africans. Sir Hillary views the ongoing political turmoil in Haiti as evidence of the international community's failure to address the ills brought about by the transatlantic slave trade. For their audacity of action, they were punished by the Western world and demonized rather than deified. Driven by France and supported by all of Europe and the United States of America, they were forced to pay blood money in the form of reparations for having defeated their enslavers. Such examples of duplicity and mendacity in our modern world are endless in the bid to end man's inhumanity to man. Sir Hillary also urged the UN to recommit to the decolonization agenda for the remaining Caribbean colonies. The Caribbean remains one of the few places in the world where there are still colonies. Many of the islands of the Caribbean are still colonies. Britain has colonies, France has colonies. The Dutch have colonies. Why do we have colonies remaining at this time in our history? Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade Carrie Simmons is calling on CARICOM member states to redouble efforts to finalize outstanding fishing agreements. He was speaking during the opening ceremony of a two-day technical workshop on the ratification and implementation of the World Trade Organization Fisheries Subsidies Agreement. Mr. Simmons says while the mandate to complete those agreements has not expired and progress has been made, there's still too much uncertainty in the sector. Member countries must, in my judgment, redouble their efforts um, and also to try to strive towards finishing phase two. The challenge which remains is for members not to roll back on what has been agreed already in principle. Despite our fears, in my judgment, the, and that is part of the misapprehension, Director, um, there are many dele or were many delegations who maintained a posture that um, this process may not be as democratic as it should be, or it is not working as it should be. And I think that what we can say by way of takeaway is that every member country, regardless of size, had a say. And all, obviously, is not agreed until everything is ultimately agreed. Cultural relations between Barbados and Japan have strengthened. It comes with a donation of 106 books from the Japanese Embassy on Japanese Culture to the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. The museum now joins the Barbados Community College and the Sydney Martin Library at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill as the only other beneficiaries of the program. Japanese Ambassador Her Excellency Kayoko Fukushima, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to Barbados, says Barbados and Japan has fostered relations since 1967 and the embassy was intensifying efforts to CARICOM Friendship Year 2024, a success. I hope these donated books will provide a wider, clearer and deeper insight of Japan through the cultural historical and educational environment activities of the museum, thereby promoting mutual understanding between our peoples and strengthening bilateral relations. Meanwhile, director of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, Alessandra Cummins, says she's looking forward to delving into the pages of the new book collection. We went through the listings. We realized this was an opportunity where we could also engage with other aspects of preservation and conservation of our cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible. Sports Night, brought to you with the compliments of Great Health Works.
agents for Omega XL. Let's head over to the sports studio where Amory Burke is standing by. Good evening, Amory. Good evening to you, Lisa. We start with news of track and field. All Saints Primary secured both the girls and boys titles in the PDA Shore and to Norris Zone on day two of the Knapsack Championships today. Competing at the Usain Bolt Sports Complex, the defending champions in the girls All Saints tally 278 points while amassing 217 to secure the boys' crown. In the PDA Light Marcy Trotman Zone, St. George Primary took away the girls' title with 259 points, while Charles F. Broom retained the boys' title with 258.5. 31 records were broken today. Here's a look at some of those track records. Off and running. 1382, the zone record. Seeing this lad here in lane number five, that's Walters of Bay Primary. Walters of Bay Primary. Can Walters hold on for the win? Walters will get it. Rayside and Nash of Bay Primary. Now trying to get into the picture here. Dondre Jack of St. George. So our top two. Bay Primaries. Shakari Nash. Lanico Rayside of Charles F. Broom, he's going to finish in second. Nash wins it. 150 meters to go. The Manny Broom of Sela Primary. Yes, there we go. In lane number two, the Manny Broom of Sela Primary. He's the leader. Broom of Sela. I know Michael Abu Worrell must be happy. Finishing up now at the 150 mark. I told you to look out for Moncter as well from St. George. She's coming. So Moncter, she is mounting an attack <laughs> for the last 100 meters. Uh, yes, uh, Warner Franklin did a lot of work early. I think she kind of relaxed though. I think she's giving herself too much work to do here. Um, but that will come with experience. 150 to go. Raphne Lovell of St. George Primary. And he's picking up the pace. Coming into the straightaway now. Yes, good strong finish from him. Lovell of St. George. So this will make it two St. George Lions mm -hmm. winning their sections. We'll see who has the fast, faster time. But for sure, our winner level of St. George Primary. Knapsack continues tomorrow with the Patsy Canada and Obadele Thompson zones. Live coverage will be on CBC TV 8 from 10 a.m. A Barbados' junior track and field team departed the island today to attend the 51st edition of the Crifty Games this weekend at the Karani James Stadium in Grenada. CBC's Anne Margaret Boyce reports. After competing for their respective schools at the Barbados Secondary School's Athletics Championships, which concluded last week, 31 junior Barbadian athletes have now joined forces with one common goal in mind, to win medals for Barbados at the Carifta Games in Grenada this Easter weekend. The athletes were all in good spirits, and head coach Ramon Armstrong says this Carifta mission is described as the rebirth after the COVID-19 pandemic. He expects the athletes to give of their best while reaching the podium. Everybody looking to go and perform their best, either repeat what they would have done or better it, um, qualifying for the championships and getting as many medals as they could. Barbados's fastest athlete, Aragon Stricker, will lead the under-20 boys and he's ready to compete against the region's best in the 200-meter event. I'm very excited because it's my, it's my second time going. So I'm very excited, especially after you got experience out last year. And my, uh, my main goals and expectations is just to go out there and have fun and get a personal best. Also pumped up is newcomer Shania Thomas, who will be competing in the under-20 girls' long and triple jump. 
as I said already, this is my last year to make Carifta, and I'm just really excited to be able to go out there and see what I'm able to do. I'm happy to be able to be with this team. It's a really talented team, and I can't wait to prove to everyone that track really is a sport that needs the attention. Barbados will be hoping to equal or better their medal hall of 10 last year. And more Goodrich boys, CBC Sports. Now the Dasani Power 8 b side excitement is still lingering in the air and tonight we take a look back at some of the best performances. With the 2024 Dasani Power 8 b side championships completed, let's look at some of the competitors who dominated for their respective schools on Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power 8, cause is power and Dasani live first, Dasani after. Burst out the blocks on our top 10 countdown. The Victor Lodorum, Alex Simmons of Comamere. They come around the curve, and it's Alex Simmons in traditional form, almost like Sister Ashlyn. Alex is going to have a slice of the spotlight. It's a household of supremacy. It's Alex Simmons, a dream come true for Mum, Dad, and all the crew. Alex Simmons hits goal for Comamere School. Up next is Taryn Braffitt of the Alexandra School. Looking silky smooth to win the under 13 girls 200 meter event. Let's watch. At number nine is Ashlyn Simmons, also of the Alexandra School. Very, very, very strong athlete. And we're looking forward to seeing how she can do in the 11 years to come from Barbados. She's actually trying to lap. Yeah, another athlete right now. Here she comes to the finishing line. We'll look to see what time she's. And she crosses the line now. Ashton Simmons quite easily. Move along to number eight. And it's Lushia Wilkinson of Princess Margaret. This is the last year. Yeah, they did compete in the same event last year, Mac McIntyre Wilkinson. I um, remember Wilkinson when she ran in the zone she she really as she comes home comes in now to raptors applause from the spectators they're yeah. really pleased with, with what they're seeing from this young lady number seven on our countdown is jelani hamlet of the st leonard's boys hamlet of st leonard's boys starts to work as well queen's college is fighting back now in the form of vassal it's vassal and hamlet vassal and hamlet hamlet goes to the front of hamlet will win Jalino Hamlet wins the under 13 boys 200 meter event. And finally at number six is Jakai Brewster of the Law School. In the final 100, it's the Law School Harrison College SMS. Here they come, Ada Ball has hit the front of Harrison College. It's Ada Ball, Ada Ball 50, Ada Ball at 10, Ada Ball is beaten by the Law School. And dynamite performance. We'll pause here for now. But on Thursday, I'll tell you who are the top five performers of BSAT 2024. That was your athlete in the spotlight, where we took a look at some of the competitors who dominated for their respective schools at the 2024 Dasani Power Aid BSAT Championships. Sponsored by Power Aid, pause is power and Dasani, the first Dasani after. The Business Report, brought to you by the Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme, a department of the Ministry of Youth and Community Empowerment, supporting young entrepreneurs from idea to enterprise. Owner and creative director at NJ Claus Art, Natalie Jackson, is looking toward the overseas market. On tonight's Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme Business Report, she talks about how about plans with Trevor Thorpe. What started as a nickname has morphed into a flourishing artistic enterprise for Natalie Jackson. NJ Claus Art had its genesis during school days. It includes her initials and it's catching on in the local marketplace. So the name came as a nickname from school, funny enough, and since artists are a bit more airy-fairy and not as serious, I decided to keep it as my artist equivalent of a pen name and made that my business name. The offerings from the enterprise are varied and include bringing other people's ideas to life. I do a range of things actually, so from cartoony works, I do children's books and portraits were my mainstay for commissions for other people. 
The creative director admits the artistic market is saturated, but at MJ Claus Art, there is an operational strategy to face conditions head on. I think mainly because my stuff is different to what's typically sold um, in terms of Bajan art. I also do a lot of personalized things. So people have their idea or a loved one they want to capture their essence on canvas and they come to me and that's how I continue. I haven't had as much exposure to the tourist market to be quite honest, but there have been a few people who have commissioned things um, from me overseas. I've had a few children's book projects that I've done for people outside of Barbados. So there have been few and far between, but I'm hoping to improve on that in the future. What about pop-up markets? Because a lot of those things happening these days, pop-ups all around you, are, are you involved in any of them? Mm -hmm. um, I am, a, what do you say, a reoccurring member um, to Anime Con, um, which is kind of very suited to my taste in the more cartoon-esque kind of art. Um, and I go to a range of any of the pop-ups as long as I'm available at the time. Ms. Jackson has been an entrepreneur since 2018 and credits her success to the training offered by the Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme. The experience with the, the whole YES program was actually very nice. And they also, they reach out to you every now and again when they have um, opportunities that they think you would be suited to. So that's very, very nice as well. Um, I appreciate them reaching out, thank you very much, um, to let me know when there's something coming up. They set you, set you on the right path to meeting good people and continuing to grow your business. With regards to the export market, Ms. Jackson already has a plan of action. After yes, I'm hoping to grow more into the regional and international markets, trying to get myself out there some more. Um, right now, I'm, as I was saying, I'm mainly commission-based, so I do a lot of work for other people. I had a show last year, which was all my own personal works, and most of them sold. This is one of the remainders from it, and I'm hoping to do more of my own work, and get that out there, get my name out there. And finding NJ Claus art is not difficult. You can find me on Instagram at NJ Claus and on WhatsApp at 832-1995. Easy to remember. The creative director tells the Yes Business Report, exploratory talks are in the works to develop a roadmap for exports of NJ Claus's products. Trevor Thorpe for the Yes Business Report. as promised Amri is back now with the second half of sports Amri over to you thanks Lisa now all of the first round fixtures in the West Indies Rising Stars under 15's championship being played in Guyana sorry played in Antigua that is ended in no results today due to rain the match between Barbados and Guyana didn't even get a single ball bowled before it was called off Meantime, Barbados won their fifth and final match of the Cricket West Indies T20 Blaze last night, defeating arch rivals Trinidad and Tobago at Warner Park in St. Kitts. Winning the toss and batting first, Barbados women were dismissed for 96 in 19.5 overs. Sprinter Steffi Sue Grimm took 5 for 8. In reply, Trinidad women were bowled out for 83 in 18.1 overs as Barbados women won by 13 runs. Spinner Erin Dean took 5 for 14 as Barbados ended the competition in fifth place on eight points. Jamaica women won the title after their victory over Leeward's women allowed to finish as they were allowed to finish undefeated. But the 2024 Roger Boyce Bodybuilding and Body Fitness Classic 2024 will bring with it a historic component, the hosting of the IFBB Elite Pro World Cup. The event stated for May 9th to 12th was recently launched at the BTMI headquarters in Warrens. Into its third year, the Roger Boyce Bodybuilding and Body Fitness Classic is about to take the competition to another level. This as they host the IFBB Elite Pro World Cup. This is a massive move for the sport which now puts Barbados into the international spotlight in a big way. And the man behind it all, Roger Boyce, says the competition will see athletes from across the globe. This year we are expecting to have some 28 countries participating in this event. So um, with that being said, um, we're hoping that they can, we can continue to grow a partnership 
so that um, it not only can develop the sport, but it can be a good economic booster for the country. Not only will there be a significant financial gain from the competition, but as we hear from promoter Shakira Duglin, it opens avenues for development of the sport here on the island. Beyond the economic benefit of this event, the World Cup event, it represents something far greater. It embodies a spirit of unity and excellence, and it's a platform for athletes to showcase their talent, their dedication, whilst inspiring countless individuals to pursue health, fitness, wellness, and of course, bodybuilding. The National Sports Council also sees it as a major initiative, and they've been lending their support through the development of the technical, administrative, and officiating elements of getting ready to host a world-class event. As we hear from the Director of Sports at the National Sports Council, Neil Morrill. The National Sports Council has not only supported the um, Roger Boyce Classic over the years, but we have worked with the B ABBFF to enhance the human resource bodybuilding capital, both um, at the level of the association and, of course, um, in the community. The 2024 Roger Boyce Bodybuilding and Body Fitness Classic and the IFBB Elite Pro World Cup is set for May 9th to 12th at the Wildey Gymnasium. And that's our news for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Good night.